listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. This is the show that talks about identity and access management and making sure you know who has access to what. Let's get started. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad. Yourself? Good. It's uh, You're in a different place today. Um, and I spent all day here at home um, getting my new iPhone up and running. Ooh, fancy. Yeah, so I got an iPhone um, 13 Pro Max. And I I have to say, you know, on one hand, it was an unbelievably easy conversion from my old iPhone, which was an XS Pro, uh, to this 13. And uh, everything cut over except... For all of my corporate apps, all of my Microsoft stuff, my Authenticator, now, I I haven't gone out to use everything, but um, it it got me thinking a lot about passwordless and kind of what we we love to talk about with passwordless is that um, unhappy path. So the scenario is you got a new phone, you've already erased your old phone or whatever. And now you have to go through setting up a new profile on the new phone. So I got to see that at least the, my situation is it kind of fell back to, all right, we'll send a code to your email that's on file and we'll send a code to your phone number, which is my new phone. So, um, yeah, it's probably not the, the most perfect scenario from a security perspective, but, um, Heck, at that point, I just wanted to get the darn thing worked because I could log into my apps. <laughs> it's definitely gotten a lot better. I mean, I've I've lived in the cloud for a long time now, so I find it easy to switch between devices. I mean, you, you've known me for a while. You know, I constantly try out new stuff, so I'm kind of used to that. But the corporate managed credentials and associated mobile device management is always a tricky spot, depending on how it's configured. So I can certainly understand the pain uh, of how that works <laughs> or in, in maybe yeah. in some cases doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, no, I know you're the guy that if I don't talk to you for two days and I send you a text message and it turns to green, I'm like, <laughs> okay, Jeff's Jeff's now on the, the latest Samsung galaxy or something. And then a couple of days later, it'll turn back to blue. I'm like, what are you doing, Jeff? Oh, I'm just, you know, you know me, just I'm just switching out. devices. Yeah. yeah I mean, just trying stuff out. I like technology. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big old nerd. What can I say? Um, and there's great phones on both sides. So whether it's blue text or green text, uh, we're all, we're all just humans, bro. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, that is a, like a, a social class divide, isn't it? Like a green texture versus blue texture. And one, one thing I've, I've realized is like, don't trivialize that because if you're joking around and you call somebody a green texture. They could take real offense to that. I, mm -hmm. I think, you know, people have gotten a, give, been given a hard time because maybe they're in a group chat with five people with iPhones and they're the one person with a, a droid and they're causing everybody's text to be green and they don't like it. Yeah, it is annoying, uh, you know, because the, the way that the different OSs handle MMS, so multimedia messaging basically is kind of the, the downfall and the lowest common denominator when it comes between iOS and Android. So some of my, we have, you know, of course I have brothers and we have our own, you know, text message thread. Some of us are on Android. Some of us are on iOS. And I can tell you right now, trying to share a video into that is a painful experience because it converts it down into the MMS format. It just, it stinks. <laughs> is, are you talking about like when somebody sends you a video and it's like, the size of a pencil eraser, yeah, you know, tiny little video and you can't watch it. Can't watch it. It's low resolution. It's just like, yeah, just, just send me a link or something <laughs> instead. It's, yeah. it's not usable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. So, so where are you this week? I am in scenic San Francisco, California, um, praying to the, uh, hotel Wi-Fi, um, all powerful beings that, uh, this. Uh, engagement that we're doing right here, this podcast recording goes through okay. So far, so good, but we'll see how that goes. I am here for the RSA conference, which 
it's been a while since I've been out here. <laughs> uh, I want to say yeah. it was 2020 last time I was here. It was right before the pandemic really kind of took hold. I remember being here and lots of people stopped going after the first day. And then kind of news broke like, oh, this is kind of a serious thing. Just couldn't really know what was going on yet. And then, uh, right. yeah, that was, that was it. But hey, it's back. I think, I think the word scenic for San Francisco is right on. I mean, you know, when I get out to San Francisco, I like to go to Fisherman's Wharf, maybe go out on the bay and get to like Alcatraz. I like to go to the Golden Gate Bridge and the, I forget what the name of that park is there with the redwoods, but um, such a beautiful part of the country. And one thing that, you know, that, that old Mark Twain saying like the coldest wood winter I ever spent was the summer in San Francisco. It can really <laughs> be true when you go out on that bay. Uh, one time I, I took a boat out to Alcatraz and I figured it was like in the, the lower fifties, but the wind was just cutting across the water and man, it was. I don't think it was enjoyable. I don't think anybody was enjoying the weather that day. It was sunny, but, oh, it was brutally cold. But now you know what it's like to go to Alcatraz. Yeah, I think it's a lot different going in this century than maybe a century ago, though. Yeah, you're probably right. Uh, yeah, it's a cool town. It's one of my favorite spots in the world, actually. Um, very walkable town, just lots of cool things to see and do and people watch and things like that. The weather is, you know, better than I'm typically used to in Chicago. So I'm always happy about that. You know, I'll be the, I'll be the nerd out there in shorts and a t-shirt and everyone else is wearing like hoodies and, you know, jeans. Cause it's cold for them. It's like, we talk about, man, it's only like 60. It's like perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd be, I'd be in the jeans. What What's the deal with the West coast? How, um, you know, they'll refer to it as the Embarcadero or you take the one oh one. I don't know. That's not, that's not how roads are referred to on the East coast. No, I don't, I don't know what that is all about. Um, I guess that's a good question. I have to ask my wife's family who's out in this area, but yeah, the, the whole the in front of things doesn't make sense to me either. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, well, that, that's a, that's something we'll have to do our further research on. There's probably a bunch of people who are listening right now. Like these dummies, they, <laughs> well, they're probably saying that regardless. Ever, <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that, that's a very good point. So, uh. Yeah, but how's the how's the uh, conference? Uh, how many people are there about? And, um, you know, what are your impressions? Yeah, I mean, I think the conference has been pretty good so far. I think there's some pent up demand for people who have not traveled in the last couple of years, maybe to finally kind of get out there. Um, as far as number of people, it's hard for me to guess because it is kind of spread out. So for those who aren't familiar, it's held at the Moscone Center in downtown San Francisco, which is pretty sizable spot basically takes up a, a city block and a lot of it spills over into sort of hotels that are all over the place kind of nearby restaurants get taken over as sort of like oh come to the you know so-and-so company thing and then they basically have the restaurant bought out for the people that they're inviting to that kind of thing so kind of spreads all over the place um you know, I would say thousands, if not tens of thousands of people are here. I know that if you don't like book your hotel room, basically the same day that they announce it, you're probably taking an Uber or a Lyft or some long walk <laughs> uh, to try and get to the conference itself. So that's a pro tip. If you're, if you're thinking about going to RSA, book the room ASAP as soon as it's announced and, uh, you'll, you'll get a much better chance of, of being in a good spot. It's close to stuff. Yeah. And the reason that's a pro tip, I mean, we've done that for years. You mm -hmm. can book with the conference code, get the good price, and usually you still cancel within, you know, a couple of days before you show up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, book it and just to be safe. And then just if you don't use it, cancel it. Uh, What's the food situation like? I was at the Moscone Center for Oracle World in 2006, which sounds it in my lifetime doesn't sound that long ago <laughs> but i realized that you know one of my kids wasn't even born at that point the other was two years old who's now you know 
uh, going into a senior year of high school. So it is a long time ago. Um, but they had this thing where it was like, okay, you would go, you know, everybody would get in lines to get a bagged lunch and stuff like that. So I'm wondering, does this work like that at RSA? Um, not really. Um, I'll be honest. I don't really eat any of the food on the conference itself. Uh, part of that is when I come to RSA, I'm typically not coming as like a full attendee. I, I basically okay. come in as a person who's really just getting like what they call the expo pass or the, the vendor hall kind of thing. It's, it's dirt cheap. It's 50 bucks, which is like a steal. Um, you get access to basically all the keynotes and that, but you don't get any of the other benefits like food or anything like that. I will say from what I've seen, that's probably okay with me. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say it's anything special or anything to write home. There are tons of restaurants and food around the convention itself. And it's, it's packed all the time. So it's pretty common. You'll see people just kind of doing their own thing for lunch anyway. Um, okay. You know, not to disparage Moscone Center food. I just, I, I don't think I've ever actually experienced it other than that's not true. Uh, last, uh, the last one I was at in 2020, I did like a little breakfast thing in the morning and it was, it was terrible. <laughs> um, it was the last day of the conference. So that's, well, that does sound disparaging. Yeah, actually. COVID was like, uh, you know, rearing its ugly head formally and I think they had like shut down pretty much everything because nobody knew what to do. So it was like, oh, here's yeah. a, you know, here's a Biscoff cracker and there's, here's some coffee <laughs> and water and that's it. <laughs> we made, we made an egg sandwich with Biscoff crackers as the bread. <laughs> <laughs> that is disgusting. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, sounds pretty bad. Um, how, how's the, uh, expo hall? Are there any major themes going on? Yes, I'm very um, happy to tell you that uh, Zero Trust has finally been solved because every single uh -huh. product, it seems, seems to have some sort of Zero Trust component as part of their marketing. Uh, so there, you shouldn't have no trouble putting Zero Trust into your organization in some way, shape, or form because apparently every, every vendor has a solution for that now. That is definitely like the biggest theme that I've seen walking through. I don't know, the hundreds of vendors that are here and, and taking in the sights and sounds. Yeah. I mean, at this point it's, it's kind of becoming a buzz phrase. It takes kind of the, um, the, uh, critical eye to see how much of it is marketing fluff versus real. I say there's probably something real behind most of it in that, you know, I, there's so many elements required of a zero trust environment. So to say this component, that component helps solve the bigger problem. True. But I still haven't seen someone, you know, solve the whole thing. Yeah. I remember we talked with, um, Eric Anderson from Adobe, I think it was a while back and they seem like he's one of the few people that I talked to was like, oh, I think they actually have zero trust. Like kind of figured out <laughs> um mm -hmm. and it was kind of envious i think other people listen to it was like oh how do i get there and you know here we are and it was probably what a year ago now at this point uh if not longer you know now zero trust has become such a buzzword through the industry that you know people are products want to get sold they're in the business to make money and they're just kind of glomming on to whatever the trendy word is just like blockchain was you know three or four years ago where you couldn't walk you know, through RSA without having some sort of blockchain related security product. Um, not saying that that's bad or good. It's just, it is what it is, right? They're writing marketing trends and whatever it might be. Um, I just feel like for whatever reason, it wouldn't surprise me that if I walked into the vendor hall tomorrow and for, you know, pulling back the, or kicking down the fourth wall here, today is Tuesday, the seventh, uh, RSA actually, I guess, formally kicked off yesterday on Monday and goes through Thursday of this week. Um, so we're recording this uh, Tuesday night, essentially Pacific time. If I walked into the vendor hall tomorrow, Wednesday, it wouldn't surprise me that there would be like a whole zero trust the movie with a whole bunch of zero trust products that you could buy. Very similar to like Spaceballs, <laughs> the movie. And, you know, here's the zero trust doll and the zero trust flamethrower <laughs> you know, and, and things like that. Disney would be wise, wise to glom onto this and, and do a Star Trek episode or um you know and they can actually do a whole new kind of mini series around I, i'm not even using what are the right terms mini series makes me sound like 
you know, Ancient? stuck in 2006 <laughs> or something, right? We'll get off your lawn. I think they call it a, you know, multi-part special or limited run series or something like that. Yeah. And they've released the entire season at once on Netflix. Uh, but anyway, what I did want to bring up, Eric Anderson, that was a great episode. That was last May 3rd and it was episode 91. So if yeah, anybody wants one. to go back and it was a really good one. And I think he not only highlighted Zero Trust and all the importance of that, but also identity being at the center of all that. And, you know, cause ultimately when you go toward this perimeterless world, you're now saying, all right, we're, you know, we're, our controls center around a few smaller or a few different things. And one of those is identity, knowing who has access to what and being able to control that with strong authentication. So, um, Go back to that episode if you if you want to hear more on that. Yeah, that was a good episode. I, I like that one, not even just for the identity stuff, but the music talk at the end. So um, some good bands to kind of check out <laughs> as part of that conversation yeah. as, we were, as we were going through it. You know, the whole identity, the center thing is really why we named the show what we did. And that's another theme that I think kind of came back out. I mean, RSA themselves kind of came back as really kind of opening the the conference with I'll paraphrase here, but like basically identity is back. Like it's part of like the strategy now and security and it's foundation and critical, all the stuff that you and I, and I'm sure others have been, you know, preaching for years, but now I think it's stepping back up into the forefront. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of what we named the show now. I don't know if we actually announced this on the show or not, but we actually have the trademark <laughs> for identity at the center. <laughs> so we'll probably have to, you know, make sure we have our trademark police, uh, out there to make sure we defend it. But, um, it, it certainly is foundational and really becoming central to security strategies, even more so I think than it was before, because the other things that I'm seeing as we're kind of going through the conference itself are, you know, obviously zero trust, but also things around identity protection, like identity fraud dealing with ransomware, you know, those are obviously big things that have been happening for the last couple of years, especially, um, given the, the, you know, the way that ransomware has really kind of taken over, uh, a lot of the different, um, incidents maybe that organizations are dealing with. So it all maps back to identity, man. It all maps back to identity, you know, and kind of one of the things that I've been working on lately is I'm, I'm working on a blog around, you know, obviously focused on identity but running identity programs and really what triggered the idea was, you know, I was working with the client and kind of the going in thought was, you know, yes, we need an IAM program and we need to kind of take over all the different areas where IAM is being done in the organization. And somehow we have to kind of centralize that almost like the, the mentality around a reporting structure. And I thought to myself, really, you know, well, first off, we have to kind of stratify and prioritize even putting together that program. And, you know, the program can bring so much more value other than just doing the actual delivery of the IAM services, especially if those IAM services are already being delivered by other parts of IT or other parts of the business even. So I call that kind of the distributed delivery model. You know, what you'll see a lot of times is maybe the um, the engineers are running privilege access management or um, secret vaults. Um, maybe your Active Directory team, especially if you're using Azure AD for your authentication platform, is running that. Maybe you've got application teams that have integrated some um, I am tools for their application. So who knows? So just pick like a Forge Rock or something where they're doing authentication for their applications. Maybe they've got some services for managing user. Maybe it's not even on the product, but when you think about standing up a program, to me, the, the real value that you're trying to drive toward is, you know, do you have the visibility? Do you have kind of the, an integrated uh, strategy and roadmap for, um, taking on these, these major, um, major issues around, you know, staying compliant, um, 
staying a, a step ahead of kind of that attack um, the surface, that attack environment that you have, and plus enabling the business with these services. It's not about a land grab of, you know, necessarily taking over running these services for the organization. I think if the focus is on, you know, that is, that's really, you know, the central um, driver for a program, you can be very successful. Now, that isn't to say that if, you know, that's not how your organization is set up, that you should drive toward that. that that's not what I'm saying at all. And furthermore, if you are not delivering these services today, in other words, it's kind of haphazard, uh, or you're at a very initial state of maturity, pulling those things in and delivering them from a central perspective, or p- perhaps looking at, you know, a managed service operation environment, those things could all make a lot of sense and, you know, kind of that centralized program plus delivery of um, IM services makes sense. But I, I guess what I'm saying is that if that's not the way you're set up, if you have a distributed delivery model, that's okay. And where I'd focus more on is making sure that you have kind of this umbrella to have all these services fall under and be coordinated. Well, I think that's, that's identity in the real world, right? I think sometimes you go in, not, not you, but when we think about identity, it's like, oh, this is perfect nirvana of there's one team that does it and everything is done by the book. Nah, man, it's, it's sloppy in the real world. (laughs) Um, you know, you're lucky, I think if that's the case and a lot of organizations may have spent a lot of time getting to that state, maybe of a centralization. I know I went through it very, very early on in my career too, where you know, the idea was to centralize a lot of that type of stuff. I think that's what makes part of this question so hard to answer too, is that's, you know, that's a question that you and I get a lot in our respective roles, right? Doing strategy and advisory and things like that in the dining spaces. How should it be done? What are other people doing? And that's what clients ask. It's like, well, I hate to give the old consultant answer. Well, it depends. Like, what are you trying to do? Like, what do you want to do? What can you realistically do given the political, you know, motives within the organization or the will to actually make changes, things like that. I still always fall back into, you know, well, who owns I am, where should it be owned? I I don't care as long as somebody owns it and they know it. It still is kind of like my default answer because I think there's just so many moving parts. You know, I'm sitting here thinking of one of the examples that I think is important to pick on, which is you know, authentication being delivered by your active directory team, because I think this happens so often, right? And it becomes one of those areas where, you know, I am program managers can take different perspective on it. One perspective might be, oh, they're doing a good job. I'm just going to let them go and do what they want to do. But here's what happens a lot of times is that the folks that are doing that say, we're doing a good job. We're just going to do what we want to do. We're not going to worry about this IEM program or information security telling them what we're going to be doing. We're just going to do it. We own it. And I think that's a very myopic view. I I think that from an organization standpoint, authentication touches so many things. It's very intertwined into, you know, the identity management or identity governance, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's part of a bigger ecosystem. And that's what the program really fosters is that all these parts are part of a bigger ecosystem. That's why access management and identity management fall under this one identity and access management umbrella. And so, again, kind of like tracing it back to that active director group is rather than trying to take the ball out of their hands, um, where they're kind of, you know, maybe they're focusing on just delivering something and they, they feel like they're doing a good job and leave me alone. It's like, you are doing a good job, but we're not going to leave you alone because what you're doing affects all these other groups and it requires visibility. And I mean, that, that's one of the, I think, biggest things about an effective IT or IM model is that somebody's checking the checkers. Or somebody who is, you know, auditing those systems and things like that. And that's where the IAM program can kind of be the go-between between between the IT risk and audit functions of an organization and those delivery groups. 
All right. So you know that I try to stay politically neutral as much as I can. But what you're describing to me sounds very much like common sense IAM laws for the organization to sort of follow and adhere by. Um, people will infer whatever they want from that statement, but I do agree that there needs to be some, especially in the identity space, right, is you're totally right on. Authentication affects everything. And it's the front door for the vast majority of the resources that an organization has to lose if they're if that door isn't protected well right so of course there needs to be some guidelines rules regulations oversight you know whatever governance term you want to throw at it to make sure that it is secure it is operating the way that's supposed to be if there are changes potentially in the environment or themes in industry right like hey you know what here's this new thing called mfa is that something we should be doing 20 years ago, <laughs> that would have been seen as like a luxury. Now it's, you know, base. Everyone should be doing it. And we still see organizations that don't, but, you know, keeping pace with those trends and things like that. So I think having some governance over all of the different services absolutely makes sense. Some probably more than others, um, just based on the criticality of the organization or, you know, the, maybe the historical success in delivering the capability. <laughs> You know, to the, to the rest of the organization, things like that. But, um, I, I'm totally right there with you on that. Yeah. Another topic that comes up a lot with, with clients in the same vein is where should the IM, where does the IM program belong? You know, and, and this really begs that question of, you know, is the program designed to, you know, foster that collaboration between uh, distributed delivery teams, or is it the delivery arm for these functions? And how have we designed information security, for example? Does it have delivery? Does it have engineers? If it doesn't, do we organize IM under InfoSec, or do we put it in a different part of IT? Now, a couple of things. One is, I think that InfoSec, you know, Pre predominantly more, much more than say 10 years ago has engineers within it because there are so many now platforms, IT platforms that are InfoSec tools, um, that InfoSec run. So they have an operational component, but I think InfoSec's traditional role is as, uh, oversight into what IT is doing to make sure that IT is following secure practice. So it starts with policies and standards and then ensuring that those policies and standards are being followed. And really, I believe like historically, IAM was one of the major areas to kind of test that boundary because now, you know, many organizations start, CISOs start to say, IAM is something that we should run for the organization. And it became very operational. Um, it got into, you know, having systems that we have to engineer that we, that have to be available or IT systems won't work, right? If authentic, if the authentication system goes down, nobody can log in. So all the IT systems stop working. If you don't have an engineering, uh, and operations, um, arm within your organization, you know, how, how can you make that work? And so I, I feel like over time, that's kind of gone away from many organizations. I don't think um, the majority of CISOs anymore are policy wonks, if you will. <laughs> I think that is kind of a 10 to 15 year ago thing where you know, I, I personally saw it all the time. Yeah, you know, this is an interesting dynamic because I think I've seen the shift too where I am and the technologies associated with it were seen as security technologies. And so there was this mindset that, well, it's a security technology. It belongs to the security team. Security team will then build up its own IT team, essentially, to support the security tools. But then we start to think about things like Windows and Active Directory. And now all of a sudden, Active Directory is your authentication. That's not being run by your security team. Typically it is being run by some sort of internal network or infrastructure team or something like that. Right. And I think that was where we started to see 
a little bit of the bifurcation of, okay, well, maybe information security isn't actually running the technology, but at least they are governing it, right? Or providing rules. Like what's the password policy, things like that. And now we've seen other platforms arise that are, um, you know, cross enterprise. I think of things like ServiceNow, for example, for ITSM tool, is that a security tool? Not directly, no, but it might be the CMDB. It might be processing access requests, you know, part of information security, right? IEM. What happens if you go out and get a product like ClearSky, which is an IGA specific technology built in the ServiceNow platform? Who's going to run that? Is it going to be your ServiceNow team or is it going to be your IAM team? I think, I think there's, I think it, you know, I'm asking the question, not really knowing the answer, but also sort of knowing that, well, the answer depends, right? How do you want to, how do you want to draw that line of who's going to be responsible for what in an enterprise platform like a ServiceNow or Windows or Amazon or whatever it may be? Yeah. And then it becomes a chicken or egg question. So. You have ServiceNow, so do you make your decision on your delivery model based on that fact, or do you choose your technology based on the delivery model that you want? For example, yeah. if you want your IAM program to deliver authentication services, and yet another team manages Azure Active Directory, do you want Azure Active Directory as your single sign-on platform? Because it's very difficult to carve out just the authentication com management component of that to your IAM team. Yep. So do you choose the technology based on that? I don't have an answer for you. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think now we're, we're kind of pontificating a little bit, but I think it just shows sort of the complexity that goes into what is the right answer. It depends. Yeah. It's different for every organization. Some organizations want to centralize. That's the way they want to do it. They see the value in it for whatever reason. Others are fine with the distributed model um, and maybe some oversight or governance or whatever you want to call it, policy making that kind of makes sure that everybody's operating, you know, with a collective set of rules, you know, rules of the road, whatever it might be, right? Those sorts of things. Others, maybe they're not big enough yet or haven't really achieved or haven't really seen any of the problems of either of those situations where like, yeah, we can get away with, you know, the two people in the company who know how everything works. They have all the privilege access. They handle all the authentication, all the keys of the castle <laughs> are in these two people's hands and we just trust them. And that's just the way it is. Yeah. I, I think also, you know, from the perspective of the consultant developing an identity and access management strategy, we're kind of like at, at some level of saying, we're going to accept the dynamics of the organization, right? I think if you're kind of like in there and you're in it for the long haul, in other words, you work for that company and you are you might want to think about challenging some of these paradigms like, okay, well, should that team be set up this way? Should we be on Active Directory down the road? Should we be, you know, should that person own this or that? When you're developing an IAM roadmap and it's kind of like, you know, say an eight to 10 week project and you're putting, I don't think you're going to challenge some of those paradigms upon which the organization is built, right? You're not going to say, hey, maybe you guys shouldn't, you know, have this you know, centralization around service now, or you shouldn't be in Active Directory for the, the long haul. I think you have to accept that. I think you have to accept some of those facts a little bit more because you're looking at, I'm not saying that you're getting tactical, but I think the scope of your IAM strategy, at one point we were talking about, you know, should IAM strategies be five years or even longer? And the thing is that our industry changes so much in five years that you've really, any kind of roadmap that goes beyond two or three years is pretty much useless. And when we're talking about challenging these big time paradigms within the organization, they're, they're beyond two, three year kind of things. Well, I only disagree in that. I think that, I think it's okay to challenge it, but I think you have to recognize that true change has to come from within. I hate to sound like a fortune cookie, but <laughs> you know, you can make the recommendation as a neutral third party outside observer to say, yeah, this is messed up. Why are you doing it this way? You should be doing it this way, this other way. 
because you've seen it work or maybe it's a better fit. But at the end of the day, it's the organization still has to change. And sometimes yeah. that's hard to do and things just don't change. That's just the way it's always been. And that's the way it's always going to be. You know, it's, it's a little bit of, you know, water erosion. Sometimes it's take place as small, little, you know, dents. And then finally there's, you know, uh, you know, some, some crack that kind of opens up and it lets you do some change. I do think it's okay to challenge it, but I think you have to recognize that you're not going to win every battle and the short projects are probably the hardest ones because you're not going to be there to be able to continue to support it, for example, and say, Hey, look, we recognize that maybe this, this should be centralized just for example, right? How are we going to do that? Okay. Well, here's how we do it. Um, and that's maybe a multi-month or multi-year effort to kind of get there. It just, it takes a while and I think it's okay to challenge, but recognize that just because some expert third-party person, hotshot consultant, like we are right, come in and say, here's what you should be doing. Doesn't mean that's actually going to happen in the real world. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, even just listening to you talk about that, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I'm, I'm going to counter my, it's going to seem that I'm going to counter myself, but I'm really not. I think there are things where you need to challenge them because one of the things you said, when you see something, you're like, oh man, that's messed up. <laughs> like those are the times where it does make sense to really challenge it. Where it's kind of like, well, that seems suboptimal. Mm -hmm. That's where maybe you just need to accept that things are the way they are. You got to pick and choose, you know, which, which battles you want to fight. Some are bigger than others, you know, is, is, you know, which, which cause are you willing to go to the mattresses for, to, to pull off the old mafia references, right? You know, what is, <laughs> what are the ones that you feel strongly about? There is conviction that this needs to change. This is what has to happen for this to be successful versus, yeah, it would be nice if that changed, but we can limp along or maybe it's not as high a risk or priority or whatever it may be, right? We see it all the time when it comes to scoping out any type of work. It's like, okay, well, we really wanted, you know, the, uh, I'll, I'll use it. I, we really wanted the Tesla with the performance package and the autopilot and everything. But the realistic is, yeah, we could probably get away with I don't know, a Chevy Bolt or something, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> we know we're going to go electric, but maybe not the, the high end electric, right? That kind of thing. So I think that's part of the calculus that goes into making those decisions is where, where do you want to spend your time and focus? Because you can't fight every battle everywhere. Like your little finger, that's going to tire you out. <laughs> that's right. I got that's a Tesla right. reference. I got a game of Thrones reference. I mean, that, that statement right there had it all. You know, I, I'm interested. Electric car. I'm, I'm in the market for a car, but I just can't decide what to get. I, I'd love to go something like Ford F-150 Lightning. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't even think you can order them now. I think you just sign up to be on some kind of like backlog list. And I don't know. I just don't want to do that either. Yeah. Everything's on a, everything's on a wait list right now. I think that's the kind of the cool thing right now is there are some there are a lot of really good electric vehicles out there. I know you hear me talk about Tesla all the time. I, I, I like mine. It's been great, but there are, there is significant competition for Tesla just in the last year. Kia has got a good one. Hyundai's got a good one. BMW just came out with one. Volvo has it. Uh, Rivian, Lucid. But, but hold on. Ford. Yes. So, <laughs> but hold on. So when you say they've got a good one, what does that mean? They've got a good commercial for one or that <laughs> they actually have a good operating model like Tesla. The operating model is different. I think vehicle wise, there are very good vehicles out there. I think the challenge is the dealer network for some of the legacy auto manufacturers, because I just read an article today, right? The Ford F-150 Lightning is just now hitting um, deliveries for the first customers. And I think it starts at like $70,000 US and a dealer that I, from the article I read today, basically marked it up 100% because they can't. So a $70,000 vehicle costs somebody $140,000 just because of the dealer arbitrary market adjustment. That's pure profit for the dealer. Is that the right thing to yeah. do? Probably not, but that's capitalism. <laughs> they can do that. Maybe for that dealer. <laughs> exactly. And that's sort of the, I think that's sort of the legacy issue that a lot of the big auto manufacturers, at least in the U S have to deal with that de dealer network 
and laws in individual states that prohibit direct sales online. So the car, the dealer lobby for each government, you can't, as much as I like Tesla, you cannot buy a Tesla direct in some states. You have to buy it out of state and then drive it in yourself or however that works. There are certain states in the U.S. that don't allow direct online sales of vehicles. So, you know, that's part of the calculus that goes into it. But I'm just purely speaking from a quality of vehicle perspective. There are a lot of good ones out now. It's not just Tesla, which I think is great. Competition drives down price, drives up product quality, you know, those sorts of things. Will I say it's perfect? No, there certainly is a wait list. And certainly demand has spiked through the roof over the last, you know, couple of months, especially with uh, the whole, um, you know, Russian Ukraine system and the energy uh, prices that have gone up. But I would definitely recommend go electric. There are a lot of good choices out there. <laughs> um, they are still a little bit expensive, but I think I saw that the, the Chevy bolt, which I sort of dumped on earlier, um, they've cut the price on it. I think it's down to like 26,000 or 27,000, which in electrical vehicle pricing is pretty darn cheap, especially if you can then layer on any, um, tax credits that might be a result of that. I mean, the thing that seems like perfect for me would be like a plug-in hybrid. Mm -hmm. Something where, you know, you can get like 70 miles a gallon or something, <laughs> something to that effect. I mean, but you know, you're never going to run out of, you know, not be able to just fill up the tank and keep going. Range anxiety is a thing in EVs. It's, it's probably the biggest thing to overcome. So I've been driving EVs now for uh, almost four years. Um, I've never had a situation where I felt like I was about to run out of charge and didn't have somewhere nearby that I couldn't get a charge at. Now that's where I live, Chicago area, which has plenty of chargers, plenty of infrastructure. Um, I, we've talked about it in several <laughs> previous shows. I'm in the process of moving to North Carolina, much smaller charging network, still doable. I could certainly drive from Chicago to North Carolina and never pay for gas and it's pure electric juice the whole, whole way down, uh, through different charging networks. But the infrastructure is definitely not at the, at the level of the sheer number of chargers that I have in Chicago area. So it requires a little more thought and planning. I do think a plug-in hybrid makes sense for most people just because yeah. there needs to be some sort of transition state, right? To kind of get people off that idea of, well, my car only has a certain number of range. They start to ration it. It's like, okay, well, most people would have actually commute. I think most people could use an electric vehicle, yeah. but until there's a significant amount of used electric vehicles out there that people can buy at different income levels, then mm -hmm. I, I think we're pretty far from, you know, most people being able to, um, fit into an EV. Yep. Price will continue to come down. Charging networks will continue to get built up. And it'll become just as common as any kind of gas station that you would see. Um, you know, it's, it's like anything else, you know, the, the seatbelt wasn't always <laughs> standard neither were, uh, electric, you know, locks and windows, All, you know, even cruise control, right. was a luxury item at some point. Now everybody has it. Price just keeps coming down. So, um, so I, I totally get it. It's certainly, I still feel a luxury item, uh, but it's a lot of fun to drive. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> So what have you been up to? Do we have um, any more topics we want to cover? Or do we want to just uh, end this thing and go out on a lighter note? Yeah. I mean, we talked RSA. I will, I want to give a special nod because I've mostly been traversing the vendor hall, looking at different products and sort of rounding out my info sec knowledge at large, since RSA is not just identity, but there was a unique experience today and the company was, it's a company called Expel. They do manage detection and response, and I'm sure zero trust because everybody does it. Um, I don't know anything about any of those things other than there was a guy who was basically rapping on the, in the booth and he was like freestyle rapping a mix of infosec security terms and stories and like tips and tricks, but then weaving it in with people who were walking by and standing around watching him and talking about them, like their shoes, their clothes, the colors, you know, whatever they were doing or glasses, whatever it may be. And this guy was like totally freestyling the whole thing. And he went on, it must've been at least 10 minutes. Cause I sat there and watched 
And I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. And then walked away and came back and he was still doing it. <laughs> um, so it was pretty neat. That was kind of interesting. So um, definitely the most unique thing that I saw on the show floor so far today. Um, okay. At least tomorrow. So tomorrow you've got to go back, find out who this guy's name is, because I'm sure he's on YouTube somewhere and then link that in the show notes. Yeah. I tweeted about it on our IDAC podcast, Twitter account. So I should have tagged a expel on that one if they have a Twitter account to see who that was. But um, I'll try to see if I can find that out. No promises, but certainly unique in, you know, a sea of, um, you know, bland corporate looking booths. Um, there were a couple of DeLoreans yeah. here of like Back to the Future. I think there was one yeah. on the show floor and there's one outside the conference uh, on one of the corners. So that's kind of cool. Um, yeah. Is there a concert? You know what? There's tons of stuff happening every night, but instead of going to those, I'm working and I'm choosing to record a podcast with you. <laughs> hey, I thank you and our listeners. Thank you. I'm sure they do. It was kind of cool to meet uh, some of the listeners who reached out. So shout out to those guys uh, that took the time to, to make some time to, for us to bump this. Um, but that was kind of cool. So, you know, maybe as this thing continues to grow, you know, we can maybe do like a formal uh, meetup and, it was at the point where it was easy enough for me to manage through LinkedIn and send individual message to people say, Hey, you know, where are you at? Let's fist bump or whatever it may be. So uh, definitely appreciate a very cool kind of feedback to get back to like, Hey, you know, and people enjoying what we're doing here. I don't think we'll ever get to the point where we can sell t-shirts, but <laughs> well, we, we can probably sell could them. give them away. The challenge is we buying give them. them away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. We can set up a whole, a whole storefront of stuff. And, uh, the challenge will always be, you know, what people want to buy it. And this is an identity podcast. Let's, let's, let's get serious, right? It's, it's probably yeah, not right. 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 <laughs> um, yeah, but I always love with, with conferences when they do have like some live entertainment. So let's talk about that. Let's end on a lighter note. What is the best vendor slash entertainment slash conference related thing that you've experienced all right so for mine there, there was no second place that was anywhere close to this it was the concert at microsoft inspire 2017 so inspire is the um uh vendor uh partner conference and so i think there were about twenty thousand attendees microsoft rented out um the washington nationals baseball park and opened up the like the outfield and had a concert with Carrie Underwood. And it was fantastic. Of course it was like free food and drinks and everything, but she was she's awesome and she was awesome that night. And uh one thing I noticed about her was that she is like her she she's got like these powerful legs. And you know me, I like to work out a lot. Mm -hmm. I think she could potentially like out squat me that potentially, I bet you she could out squat me in the gym. Um, I don't have any comment on either of those things. <laughs> so <laughs> as a fair, other than that is a pretty cool experience. I mean, I mean, just the, it probably cost them what two, 300 bucks to, to rent out an entire stadium <laughs> and get an yeah, A-list yeah. uh, entertainer like that on, on the stage. Couple bucks. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I don't know if she was A-list at the time or not, but she was probably B+. plus. Well, she was on American Idol, right? Uh, yeah, I think she was on American Idol. It's like, so maybe it was... I think she was known. Mm -hmm. I don't know. She Maybe she was A-list at the time. I was pretty excited because, you know, I like country music. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> let's see, what's mine? I don't have any cool stories. I just have a unique one. I think probably the one that sticks out in my head there right now is it was at Gartner, I want to say six or seven years ago. And I don't remember who the vendor was, but it was, it was at Gartner and it was at the Caesars Palace in Vegas. And one of the vendors, they had like these breakout conference rooms, right? That they can like basically like ballrooms that, that people could buy basically, um, for the show. And one of the vendors installed a wrestling ring, like a full-size wrestling ring, and had luchadors in there 
doing like a wrestling show in the middle of this ballroom <laughs> inside of the Caesars Palace uh, Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. I don't know if I've ever seen anything close to that from a uniqueness standpoint. It was definitely weird going in and having like this full size wrestling ring set up with like ropes, the mat, like everything. It was like a, a legit thing. And it took up basically the entire thing. And basically people would kind of file in and go around it as they were kind of coming in and, and, and going and stuff like that. So unique for sure. Um, yeah. Can't say that it was, uh, you know, as cool as yours, but definitely unique. Yeah, conferences, you can have some really good experiences at. And I bet you somebody's out there listening with some even better stories than we had. But yeah, that was, those were, I mean, Carrie Underwood for me was, that was a great one. Um, but I would say every conference, just, you know, being there in the city, um, you know, getting to network with everyone that, uh, that you talk to on the phone and, you know, shoot a lot of the folks that we've had on the, on the podcast over the last couple of years are people that the only time we ever see them are at conferences. So, um, yeah, I, exciting stuff. Yeah. It's good to take advantage of the networking and stuff like that. So, um, I'm going to try and see if I can meet up with uh, Julie Smith of IDSA fame. I think our reigning champion for a number of visits, uh, on the show, uh, tomorrow at some point, uh, Andrew Shikiar, I think is here. So I'm going to try to fist bump with him, Den Jones, you know, a lot of stuff that a lot of the folks that we've been able to like have on the show as guests and Chase Cunningham, but, I know is there. Yep. Um, uh, really everybody's here, <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to figure the time to kind of get in and, and do the fist bumps is always a challenge, but, um, yeah, it's kind of cool, right. To kind of get out there and, um, mingle amongst the identity, even if it isn't in a, in a purely identity conference. Awesome, man. All right, let's go ahead and wrap this up. I feel like we're tempting hotel Wi-Fi gods with at least what so far seems to have been a, a an, an okay appearance and audio recording here on my mobile setup. Yes. So we'll see how it goes. Been really good. Uh, hats out to to Marriott uh, Marquis, I guess, uh, and the and their hotel Wi-Fi. So far, so good. Um, all right, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Um, let's see, what do we got going on? Uh, this show will go live the 13th so you're listening to sort of like the rsa stuff that we kind of briefly touched on um we'll have more shows coming up our live stream is still sort of on hold as i figure out my life and moving across the country <laughs> to, uh in the next couple of weeks here so that hopefully will resolve itself in the next month or so we'll get back to that um you can always find us on the web identity at the center.com or on twitter at idac podcast uh any final thoughts jim no, I mean, you know, as usual, please reach out, make that connection if we haven't already on LinkedIn and, um, you know, definitely love to message and hear what you'd like to hear more about on the show. And I think, you know, Jeff and I are always looking for topics to dive into. So your ideas on topics would be very welcome. How about you, yep. Jeff? No, I mean, that's, that's right on. I mean, we love hearing from, from folks who are listening, what do they want to hear? So send ideas our way and uh we'll get it into the queue and uh and uh hopefully address it so all right i'm starting to ramble it's late i know it's late for you um yeah it's 11 o'clock at night here so the, the dedication jim it's just it's it's fantastic um hey right. we haven't missed a week we don't we don't miss weeks we try not we don't to don't miss weeks we've come close a couple times we've come close but we haven't and uh, I mean, other than like the Christmas break, but that's intentional. Yeah, that's a planned one. That doesn't count. We're going to be yeah. celebrating three years in a couple of weeks. So our, th our three year birthday, third year of doing this podcast is July 3rd. So for the number of shows we've put out, let's, uh, let's see, this is a think 150. We should have 155 by then over three years. And wow. it's pretty crazy. The number of episodes we've put out. I think it's just being consistent yeah. too, but there have been some close calls. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. Let's call it. Um, thanks Jim for your time. Um, thank you all for listening as well. And we'll talk with everyone in the next one. 
Thanks for listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe and visit us on the web at identityatthecenter.com.